I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, I'm going to start off this video by catching up on a few things we've been talking about a lot this week, and we're going to watch a satellite animation here from sunup to sundown yesterday uh, on Wednesday. A few things to be pointing out. Let's start west and go to the east. We saw quite a few uh, big thunderstorms that went through parts of Canada, including some uh, storms that made some hail here in Alberta. A lot of storms popping up in the mountains here, including right here in the Sierra Nevada. Neat to see those storms kind of running up over there, getting the orographic lift and putting out some pretty heavy precipitation. We can still see, if you notice at the very end, it's hard to tell, but there are still our wildfires going in parts of Arizona. And across the central plains, while the storms were firing up along the front range here, just a few isolated large thunderstorm cells that move through parts of the south central plains. Meanwhile, to the south, we're going to watch this area of the next several days as potentially having some heavy rainfall. But our deep upper level low that's kept temperatures relatively cool across the eastern third of the United States, we did get some kind of convective pop-up storms that kind of rolled around the back side of this uh, as the atmosphere destabilized in the upper levels and brought in some, at times, very locally heavy rain from some of these storms. And finally, all the way out here to the east, this is our latest named tropical system, Dolly, uh, which is going to be moving out to open ocean and not really causing too much of an issue. But as you can see down here on the southern edge of this view, this is the dust that we've been talking about coming from the Sahara. And just to give you an update on a dust plume and how it's going to be moving across the open Atlantic and then into the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, this animation here just kind of shows us where the greatest optical depth or the most dust will be in the atmosphere. And it's certainly going to be impacting a lot of us here in the eastern half of the United States. So what do you expect out of this? Well, as we talked about, yes, it's going to give us some interesting sunrises and sunsets, probably be more red, but also you might find some red on your vehicles. And this is what I'm talking about. Great post here by Ada that shows us uh, some of the dust that often accumulates after a rain or just accumulates on like a windshield. So when you turn your wipers on, uh, you can see the dust piling up there. Notice it may have a bit of a red tint to it, uh, which would again kind of give a good indicator that it's from the Sahara. And I got asked a question, sh can you taste the difference between U.S. dust and Saharan dust. I have no idea about the answer to that question, uh, but I don't think you need to taste this. Just look at the color and I think you'll have a good idea where it came from. So check that out. Another story we've been following is what's going on in Siberia. And I do want to encourage you to watch my long range update yesterday where I talked about the influence of the heat wave that has happened in sections of Russia and Siberia and its potential impact on July weather patterns. But you can still see here the air quality, major degradation in the air quality due to all of the fires that's been caused by this extreme heat and dry weather in this part of Siberia. And lastly, kind of in our, our, our update here of things we've been talking about, I showed this in yesterday's long range outlook where we were talking about um, some locusts that have now arrived in parts of Argentina, Brazil, and I believe Paraguay as well. Um, and I just want to make a point, we're still watching the locusts moving through Iran, Pakistan, India, and also through parts of Africa across the Sahel. But um, I got another video just to show you. I saw this tweeted out last night. Philip Shaw um, said they're heading toward Brazil and he takes a shovel here and kind of peels them off of a tree. Um, I've never experienced anything like this, so to watch this is just amazing for me to see locusts like this. Uh, but apparently this swarm is quite large and doing a lot of damage to crops there. So let's come back to the United States, North America here. This is temperature anomalies over the last 30 days. And we have seen a pretty sizable increase right in through here after going through um, you know, a, a cooler start to May and certainly a cold April. Uh, when we look at all of this though, what I wanna discuss here is how we've recovered in terms of growing degree day anomalies. Because the cool April and cooler May had set us off with a bit of a deficit. And we still have that deficit in GDU units over here here um, on the uh, kind of in parts of the Mid-South, the East Coast, getting all the way back to the lower Mississippi River Valley. But that warmth that's been spreading through this area has really brought up those numbers. And I, I need to produce a whole global map of this and a North American map, at least, because the data I'm using here is prism data, and it kind of cuts off there at the border. But uh, that warmth has extended into the Great Lakes states and also into the um, Canadian provinces that surround it. Now, I got a question for you. I saw this come up late last night on Twitter, and I hope someone in North Dakota can answer. Maybe, Tom, if you could answer this for me, I'd appreciate it. But apparently, this is Mount Fargo. I guess there is still um, kind of a, a, a mountain of snow underneath all that dirt there in Fargo. So despite all that heat that's built back in and potential for going up into the upper 80s and 90s in the near term here, there's apparently still a pile of snow that I guess at one point was over 80 feet tall. Can someone confirm this? I'd love to hear more about it. 
But here's what the change is going to look like. Remember last videos, we've been talking about this trough. I know it doesn't look like much, but that trough right there. You see the jet stream is accelerating in this direction here as we have high pressure to the south and low pressure to the north. And it's going to be the position of this trough and its movement over the coming days that's going to really set us up for a very dynamic pattern across North America. So here's what things look like as we get into next week. Now, a couple things I want to point out to you. This pattern has hints of blocking. Remember, to be a block, the whole of the jet stream pattern needs to stay in a relatively similar configuration for at least 10 days. But we do see almost an omega-like pattern here, and then you notice almost another one there. And omega patterns are, are the type of pattern that tends to be more meridional, more north-south than it does uh, and west to east. So the trough that's sweeping into the western United States, cooling things down there, out ahead of it has a sizable ridge that then goes up into the Great Lakes states. And we've got to talk about what that means because it could mean very unsettled weather for the Canadian prairies, the U.S. prairies, and the Corn Belt. But getting over to the Great Lakes states, we could be talking about drier conditions at times. All right. So let's get into this. I want to now show you the actual more meteorological map of this. And again, there is that pattern that I'm watching develop here uh, to this large ridge moving through the Great Lakes states early into next week. So what does this pattern mean? Where will those storms be located? And what about these temperature uh, differences? We need to be certainly talking about that. So over the next five days, really building in some heat into this area. And as you saw, this was an area that had seen a recovery in the temperatures and really warming up. Up. We do see cooler than average weather emerging down here in parts of our uh, cotton belt and cooler starting to show up in the northwest as that trough digs in. But I would like to take you right here into Ontario to show you that as this heat builds in, I expect to see more pictures like this. Brandon Wilkins posted this yesterday and it's, uh, talking about how quickly his corn grew over the last week. Well, Brandon, I think we're going to be seeing more heat in your area and I hope the moisture is there to really get this corn to take off for you as it has already over the last week. So that's what the rapid accumulation of GDUs recently has done for us. Now let's talk about severe weather first before we get into that heat. Over the next three days, I got them labeled there at the top. So we have uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday across the top here. We're going to be watching a, a boundary, a frontal boundary that's going to be moving out of the high plains uh, in the north central plains of the United States over toward the Great Lakes states in the Midwest by the time we get into the day on Friday. So the Storm Prediction Center has this area kind of under the gun for severe weather. Now today on Thursday, this does extend up into parts of Manitoba and parts of Saskatchewan, and that's because uh, the storms that went through the Alberta yesterday, which, by the way, produced some pretty interesting hail pictures here. This is from Kyle uh, showing a great view of the hail in here, Alberta. One thing I want to point out is you can see the more opaque ice in the center. That's your rapid ice growth. This is the embryo of the hailstone. And then as it got splattered with super cooled water on the outside, much slower growth regime giving you that clear view. I wanted to point that out. It's a neat picture to kind of understand the science behind the growth of a hailstone. But that severe weather threat today goes here and then over here on Friday and then over toward the north and east as we work in the day on Saturday. And our winds are showing that. You can see the moisture return coming up like this and then really getting in through here on Friday. We're going to watch this carefully and then uh, uh, into this location over on Saturday. But do notice what we've got re-emerging here on Saturday coming out of the north central plains and the Canadian prairies. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. So this is what the next week looks like. And as that trough digs in, very unsettled weather here for uh, the Dakotas getting back into Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and also Montana. We're going to watch a front push through at the end of this week, which you just saw, and then slowly rebound going back to the north, giving us multiple chances of, of thunderstorms and some rainfall here. Now I want to get these drawings off here because I want to show you a few critical areas that we're going to need this rainfall, specifically parts of the eastern Corn Belt and this region right in through here, which has missed out on a lot of the recent rain. You can see through parts of the Cotton Belt, widely scattered storms bringing anywhere between a half inch and in some locations over an inch and a half. But this whole pattern is really missing this area. So once again, we're going to be discussing drought expansion as we look out into the forecast as that region in the south uh, western United States getting into western Kansas, Colorado could be drier uh, in the near term here. So with this picture, what I would like to do next is show you how things compare to normal over that time period. And once again, uh, we're going to see in a few minutes how critical the rains could be in and around Kansas City. 
and the rains that are coming through here, how much time do we buy? Should we go over to a drier pattern as that highly amplified ridge builds into the Great Lakes states? We need to be discussing that. So even though we got some wetter weather coming through parts of the Cotton Belt, remember this is a very wet and stormy time of year for the Cotton Belt. So drier risks back to the west here. And if you don't get hit by some of these thunderstorms, things uh, could continue to stay over on the drier side. So why I say those rains are critical? Well, you can see right here the area of the last couple of weeks that's been missed in parts of eastern Kansas, uh, um, Oklahoma, as well as northern Arkansas and Missouri. Eastern Corn Belt, there are pockets that have been missed. And while we expect to get very good rains here in parts of the Dakotas in the coming days, notice the dryness that we're going to be overcoming there. Patchy dryness down here in the south and southeast. And um, you can see the heavy rains that we had experienced from that cutoff load that sat over parts of Virginia and North Carolina. It is dry in parts of the northeast, and we do expect some warmer temperatures there. And uh, so this is going to be a map that will be changing quite a bit over the coming days. So let's watch this all unfold fold with uh, the European model. Clicking play here, I'm going to pause it and take you back so we can see the next uh, couple of uh, um, days here. So as we work our way into the evening hours tonight, this will be the area that we're going to watch for the showers and storms and also down here along the Gulf Coast. Pulling through the day here on Friday, there we go, Friday morning, afternoon, and evening, the severe weather threat again is going to shift right into this area. So the moisture transport coming up through Texas, so scattered storms in through this area, and the boundary is going to set up right in through here on which we're going to watch these thunderstorms fire up. So again, this is Friday afternoon and getting into the evening hours. Could be very stormy right in through this corridor on Friday evening, so watch it very carefully. As we play this forward, watch what that boundary does. By Saturday morning, slides through parts of the central and eastern Corn Belt. This is Saturday afternoon afternoon and evening. So stormy day again right through here stretching into the northeast. You can see the transport of moisture coming around this big subtropical high. It's way over here but coming around just like that. Now this is going to feed into this area. From here the transition begins because you start to see low pressure developing. See it right there up into parts of the Canadian prairies. The trough is now establishing itself. So what does that mean? Well that means this boundary that's in through here is going to stall out. And if it stalls out in the day on Sunday, getting into the day on Monday, that could be bringing meaningful rainfall into this area that we're going to need to endure some hotter and drier conditions moving into the Great Lakes states. But now the boundary has reoriented itself. And on Monday, it's now a warm front and it's pushing back to the north. So you can see it now. See the low pressure there? The flow comes up and just like this. And now we start to get the development of the higher atmospheric, excuse me, lower atmospheric pressure here. And that's where the storms really start to take off in the Canadian prairies. Now we're out to next Tuesday at this point. So what I want to show you is the general stormy pattern that we see in this area next week, okay? But this is again before that or as that big ridge builds into the Great Lakes states. And so I'm a bit concerned about maybe getting some drier conditions in and around the Great Lakes states and the Canadian provinces that surround them, okay? So we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. Now, I'm pretty far out here in the operational forecast. So let's come back to a topic I mentioned at the beginning. Does this pattern show hints of blocking? And remember, by definition, a block is at least 10 days long. I want to watch this feature right here very carefully. It's a trough that we see out by day 10 in the forecast developing on the East Coast. We see the trough here. So the pattern is doing something a bit like this with our ridge kind of anchored in this direction, pointing in that direction, southwest to northeast. Okay, when I see this, a couple of things I want to point out. Technically, this is a three-wave pattern. We have uh, wave one, wave two, wave three in the ridges, and here's wave one, wave two, wave three in the troughs. And the smaller the wave number pattern, the longer the waves, and hence uh, the slower they progress. I am concerned over the above average temperatures and drier risks for some of the Great Lakes states as we move forward. But we need to know, are we shutting down the Gulf of Mexico moisture transport? Because if you want to know what dry conditions look like in the Great Lakes states, which is right here, this basin for July, this is what needs to happen. This trough position that I've labeled with an arrow is most critical. Should it remain off of the West Coast and really be really setting up the flow like this, this trough position is critical. Now, right now, we're expecting it to stay a little bit farther uh, to the coast, which is going to be 
the most important feature moving forward as to whether or not the Great Lakes states really go into dry. And should this same trough feature for some reason retrograde and come back here, then that would move the drier risks over into the Corn Belt, which we're not anticipating at this point, but it is a possibility. So when we look out at week two, the GFS has lots of storms in through this whole region, as you can see here, and it's trying to do something in the tropics. Big question marks on that, okay? The uh, European is keeping much of the Corn Belt, the Western Corn Belt, over here into the High Plains and Canadian Prairies wet, and it's also keeping down here in the Cotton Belt wet, but you can see the influence of that ridge possibly lending over to drier conditions. I still think we will see thunderstorm activity in this area. But it is definitely going to be that hit or miss variety due to the position of that ridge. And all that ridge does is it just prevents boundaries from setting up in there. So why that's important is that means some folks are going to get rain out of this and some are not. But with the heat, the lack of dry air during this time period means I think we're going to still see storms pop and take on kind of a life of their own. Now let me show you what I mean. Going out here to day 10, we will see at times high pressure cells setting up in this area. Okay, that's what I'm showing you right here. And yep, that's going to give us some drier time periods as we get into the month of July. But I do notice that it doesn't stay that way. By July the 9th, the models are still keeping the subtropical ridge here and the Gulf of Mexico transport open. So the rains coming through this area in the next week will be critical to see how they supply moisture and how they possibly help carry through what could be some drier time periods as we get our way into the first week of July for the Great Lakes Basin. Okay, that's what I really want to, want to, want to see here. But I noticed this, going out there toward that July 9th time period, while the trough is expected to sit here, uh, we do see that there could be some northwest flow through this area. And if that northwest flow comes in, you can see it in the wind field, right? So the trough comes out like here. Yes, it's unsettled there, but that northwest flow in through here could be the saving grace for um, bringing in some uh, storms in through this part uh, of the country. Okay, so we'll keep that all in mind as we move forward. What are temperatures going to do? Well, this is the high temperatures today on Thursday. Still very hot from Phoenix all the way through Sacramento. So this, uh, the middle va uh, central valley here of California is still warm. But what you're going to see is um, the warmth rebounding here already in the central plains. A lot of 90s extending pretty far to the north. That's why I'd like to know how that Fargo snow pile is doing here. As we go from there into the day on Friday, we can see the temperatures really rebounding in the Midwest and the Great Lakes states. And look at the heat coming into the northern plains here, Saturday into Sunday. That's that rebound of high heat going right up the central plains, right through the Midwest as the trough digs in here on Monday, right? So above average temperatures, going to be seeing a lot of upper 80s and lower 90s during this time period and it extends into Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. So there's that ridge fully established in this area. These temperatures are likely biased a little bit low. I think we could be seeing a lot more upper 80s and lower 90s than what's being advertised at this point. Meanwhile, back into Texas, still the heat is on down here as well. Going out to that six to 10 day time period, that's where you really see the pattern fully unfold. The GFS here, the European there, both saying very similar stories here in the temperature pattern. And that same story extends out to 11 to 15 day. So what's important to know is that these are above average temperatures during the hottest time of the year. Okay, so to be three, four, five degrees above average during the hottest time of year is really pushing our temperatures in this area triple digits down here and then getting uh, into this area a lot of mid uh, possibly getting into the low to mid 90s which is what we're going to be watching out for okay last couple of things i want to point out to you let's go uh, international really quickly europe we're going to be seeing a very uh, highly evolving pattern there but over the next 10 days things look to be w uh, very uh, warm at times stormy over in western europe but notice around the black sea region right in through here we're continuing to see some drier conditions and I think the last thing I'm going to share with you on Twitter last night, I was kind of just keeping an update on a few things. And I noticed that there's possibly going to be a reboot of the movie Twister. I don't know how I feel about this yet, but I thought I'd throw it out there for some discussion. All right, we'll stop it right there. Have a great end to your week. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.